without further ado, I'm just going to introduce you to uh, Michael Omer and uh, Molly to talk about how your solicitor can help you in your property journey. Welcome, Michael and Molly. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you all this evening, Chris. Uh, I'm Michael Olmer. I'm a commercial consultant solicitor who's been at Clapham College for nearly nine years now. And this is my colleague, Molly Byrne, who's a specialist corporate solicitor, uh, who's been at Clapham College, what? Four years. Four years, yeah. yeah. I'm going to talk about how your solicitor can help you in your property search during the time that you own your property and how we can help you when the time comes to sell your property. Molly is going to talk a little bit in detail about the pros and cons of owning property through the medium of a limited company. When you are carrying out your search for a property, there are some basic points you need to think about. Are you looking for a freehold property or a leasehold property? Freehold property is a, normally a standalone building where you own the building and the land it sits on. With a leasehold, which is normally how flats are owned, you own the property for a period of time. Traditionally, leases were for 99 years. Uh, later, they became uh, extended to 125 years as the common term. Uh, and very often nowadays, they can be for 999 years. You can get leasehold houses, but they are much less common than they used to be, particularly because in recent years, lenders have taken against them due to the uh, rapaciousness of developers in trying to monetize the future and extract high ground rents and fees from the owners of those properties. You might, you might well want to buy at auction. Auction has the advantage of certainty. When you go to an auction and you bid on a property, effectively it's yours when the hammer falls. The disadvantage of buying at auction is that you have to do your homework in advance. This may involve getting the legal pack from the auctioneers or from the seller's solicitors, for which you may have to pay, and you may also need professional help from a solicitor in interpreting the contents of that legal pack. Typically, what you'll find in a legal pack is a copy of the title deeds to the property, the normal pre-contract searches, which the seller's solicitors will have carried out, and usually some other basic information about the property. But you need to have an opportunity potentially to ask supplementary questions on points arising out of things that you find in the legal pack. Uh, last year I acted for a client who bought in haste at auction uh, and thought he was going to be repenting at leisure, uh, only to find later on between exchange of contracts and completion that the seller solicitors had made a fundamental error and so he was able to get his deposit back and his wasted legal costs. But that's highly unusual. Whether you're buying by private treaty, in other words, through an estate agent or direct from the seller or at auction, <clears throat> one of the things to look out for are restrictions in the deeds. Now, these can affect both freehold and leasehold properties. And essentially, they put restrictions on how you can use the property. Restrictions in deeds are separ a separate issue from planning restrictions. And these, in particular, can include restrictions, covenants against short-term lettings, or uh, can restrict property to being only capable of being used in the occupation of one family, or words to that effect. That can mean, for instance, that you could not use the property as a house in multiple occupation, an HMO. And if that's what you're intending to do, this restriction would stop you. You can also find that the property is affected by planning restrictions, particularly on short-term lettings for holidays uh, or for use for Airbnb lettings, uh, particularly in London, 
there are lots of planning restrictions um, that affect short-term lettings. Uh, with lettings of flats, there can also be restrictions in terms of the type of person that you can let to. Uh, you can have problems with tenants who create noise and nuisance to the other residents in the building. Houses in multiple occupation bring with them a whole host of issues of their own, in particular planning restrictions, the need for licensing, and in particular the fact that if an HMO has an existing license, that license is not transferable. So you are going to have to pay for a new license when you buy the property to continue to use it as an HMO and make sure that the property is compliant with health and safety, fire and other regulations. One other issue, one other area that is becoming much more important uh, is the energy performance rating of all buildings. Uh, we heard in the first half that from 2025, uh, rental properties uh, with a rating D or below, and this applies to both residential and commercial properties, uh, will be unlettable unless they have their EPC rating raised uh, by improvements to their uh, insulation uh, and energy efficiency. So these are all things that need to be considered before you buy and that we can help you with uh, in investigating the viability of a purchase before the time comes to actually put down a deposit, exchange contracts or bid at auction. Before buying a property, one of the main considerations that many investors have is whether to hold the property in their own personal names or to buy through a company. Now, if you're buying a property in your personal name, you own it. If you're buying more than one property or you already own a residential property, for each subsequent property that you buy, you'll be subject to paying a stamp duty surcharge, which can, which can amount to a significant uh, additional cost when you buy a property. There are reliefs available, um, which we don't have the time to get into tonight. Uh, but your accountant or solicitor can advise you on such things as multiple dwellings relief. <coughs> I'm going to hand over to Molly now uh, to talk about the pros and cons of buying through the medium of a limited company. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Good evening, everybody. So we are often asked by people who are purchasing buy-to-let properties if they should be doing so in their personal name or using a company. So there's lots of pros and pros and cons for each um, of those structures and your decision will largely be based on things such as tax considerations which we touched on after this I believe, <coughs> um, your personal income, the size of your portfolio and how often you want to access the income you're making from the rent so if it's something you need to live on monthly or if it's something you'd like to build up within your company as um, expendable income. So if you have a large portfolio it's likely that you're going to want to create a company before you purchase your first property. Um, and it can be a preconception of a number of individuals that it is better to purchase um, using a company because of what we call the corporate veil. So the idea is that a company, its liability is separate from your personal liability. So if the company has a liability, it can't come back on you. What I would say to those people is what you need to consider is if you're buying the property using a company, um, the lender is likely to ask you to also give a personal guarantee. Okay, so what that means is the owners of the company or the directors of the company enter into a direct agreement with the lender outside of the company's property purchase, which says that those owners and those directors will make repayments to the lender if the company is unable to do so. So that's where your personal liability will come in, even if you use a company. So. The contents of a personal guarantee will vary, and that will vary depending on the size of the loan, the lender, and a number of other factors. But the things I would tell you to look out for, and the terms that will generally be included, is that you are personally guaranteeing any amounts owed to the lender by the company for the loan, but that is in addition to any of their costs, charges, expenses, and interest. So it's not limited to the mortgage amount. Um, 
You can get limited guarantees, but it is often unlimited in nature. Um, the lender doesn't first have to enforce it against the company, so they don't have to pursue the company um, through the courts if there's outstanding uh, loan repayments. They can just come to you as a personal guarantee, as personal guarantor, and ask you to make those payments. And the guarantee remains in place until it's withdrawn. So if you step away from your involvement in the company, if you sell the company, it goes into administration, you lose mental capacity, or even in the case of your death, the personal guarantee remains and it will stay with you or your estate. You can ask to be released, but it is unlikely that the lender will do so, especially if you can't provide an adequate alternative, such as a new personal guarantee from a new director or shareholder. So the process generally is you instruct a property solicitor to buy the property for you and you instruct another solicitor to give you independent legal advice on the personal guarantee. The lender will require you to have two solicitors because the courts say to them that they cannot enforce the personal guarantee unless they are completely certain that that guarantor understands the terms and the nature of the personal guarantee. Um, so your advising solicitor will get all the documents from your property solicitor. They will need to meet with you face to face to explain the nature of the personal guarantee. And then they will sign a certificate and give that to the lender if they're content that you have understood the terms of the personal guarantee. But you should also be aware that the fees for the independent legal advice on the personal guarantee will be paid by you personally. You can't charge those back to the company. So I will hand back to Michael now because we are running out of time. Okay. Uh, very quickly, continuing on with buying through a company, in addition to registering the mortgage <coughs> at uh, the land registry, it's also going <coughs> to be registered at company's house. Beware a potential stamp duty trap for buying a property through a company that you don't use for business purposes. Um, if the property is worth more than uh, £500,000, there can be a stamp duty surcharge of 15% for what's called an enveloped dwelling, which is what I'll call a passive asset. It's not used in a business. Um, in addition to that, because it's owned by a company, there can also be a substantial annual tax on an envelope dwelling, which starts at £3,800 per year. What we do when we're carrying out due diligence on a property for you is we carry out pre-contract searches, uh, which sounds very quaint, but essentially it's gathering the documentary information about the property looking into planning issues and any restrictions, gathering any paperwork, looking at environmental considerations, and these are becoming more and more important, uh, looking at health and safety issues concerning compliance with building regulations for boilers, electrical installations, etc., and also looking at the rights that any third parties might have that could impact the property, such things as rights of way, um, rights to cross your property as a means of escape in case of fire, or rights to run drains through the land. Once you've bought your property, you'll want to rent it out. Uh, we can help with drawing up tenancy agreements. Uh, we can advise you on how to take a tenant's deposit in a compliant way, so as to deposit it with a government-approved tenancy deposit protection scheme, or uh, an insurance-backed scheme in lieu of a deposit. Uh, compliance with documentary requirements, providing the necessary how to rent booklets to tenants, uh, making sure you have all the correct certificates for uh, legitimately renting the property out, and also advise you on how to comply with the immigration re requirements that have now been imposed on landlords to ensure that everybody who rents a property from you has the right to be in the country and the right to rent it. I was involved with property through my family for 30 years, and during that time, we only ever had to sue two tenants for possession. Um, you will have, at some point, issues with rent arrears, um, hopefully only once every 30 years, unlike us with two. Um, you will have issues sooner or later with nuisance tenants and the need to recover possession. We can help you with making sure that the proper notices seeking possession are served, and if it goes to court, represent you in court at a possession hearing. When your time comes to sell, 
we can help you with preparing the legal pack, gathering all the paperwork that you would have seen uh, when you bought the property, making sure it's up to date. If you're going to sell at auction, we can have that pack available for your buyers uh, to consider before they bid. And we can also help you if you want to sell the property with the benefit of tenants who are already in possession. If you've got any questions, be happy to answer them afterwards um, or happy to deal with inquiries by email or by phone at our office. And thank you very much for your time and attention.